So uh, we're, we're going to start with, uh, of course, you know, for, for any Acer booklets that we use, uh, I'm not going to give you all the question because uh, it's very important that you purchase or own or have uh, the, um, uh, the Acer booklets. They haven't not changed over the years, so if you have one from years ago, uh, they're exactly the same. Um, it does not matter uh, which edition. And so right now we're going to look at questions 40 and 41 from, um, from the blue booklet. And some students have had uh, particular difficulties with this uh, with this passage um, because they're not sure how to compare the different structures. Um, so basically, I'm going to give you the standard approach how to compare um, three-dimensional structures. And the standard approach is to convert the three-dimensional structure into a two-dimensional view. And that two-dimensional view is called a Fisher projection. So we're going to convert three-dimensional molecules into Fisher projections, then I'm going to give you two rules that you need to know in order to compare the, the different structures. Then you'll, you'll, um, you'll, I'm going to ask you to convert the other three structures into Fisher projections and then uh, lay them over each other. And then you will uh, know which ones uh, are, um, are superimposable. So first, um, it's going to, this is going to be an exercise in your imagination. And some of you are going to get it very quickly, but some, some of you, you're going to have to think about this a few more times in order for it to be clear. But the bottom line is that, um, is that when we're looking at a Fisher projection, okay, so this is a three-dimensional uh, figure here, and we're going to convert it into this two-dimensional form here. First, I want to talk about this three-dimensional figure because there are some ideas that you should have in the back of your mind. If you've never heard this before, then it's impossible that you're going to fully understand it, but then just memorize it. If you've heard this before, then I, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to tell me um, uh, some, issue, some uh, answers regarding the hybridization of the bonds between carbon and uh, other substituents. In this particular case, carbon, as you see, is bonded to four different uh, um, substituents or groups. You can call them substituents, groups, or ligands. When, when carbon is bonded to four uh, different groups, yes, you are exactly right. Um, if they are four different groups, this is a chiral carbon. Um, sometimes uh, you'll hear Acer call it a stereogenic carbon or a stereocenter, but um, uh, it's a chiral carbon. That is correct. And all the bonds are sp3 hybridized. So if you never heard of that, just memorize it. So if, car if carbon is bonded to four, uh, to four uh, groups, then the uh, bonds that carbon has is sp3 hybridized. And the shape that carbon is in is uh, called a classic tetrahedral shape. Tetrahedron is a type of a pyramid. Try to imagine this. The carbon is at the center of the pyramid, where the top of the pyramid is here. Then at the bottom of the pyramid, pyramid, you have a triangle, one, two, three, and then carbon is in the center of the pyramid. So that's how we try to imagine the tetrahedral shape. The bond angle for tetrahedral shape is 109.5 degrees. It's not that Acer is going to ask you that number, 109.5 degrees, but by knowing that number, sometimes it will give you an advantage when there are uh, questions that have some ambiguity to them. So. Um, so that is the standard um, tetrahedral angle. Now, when carbon is not bonded to four different substituents, it's only bonded to three, um, what is the shape and what is the bond angle and what is the hybridized bond? We are no longer talking about sp3. Yes, it's sp2. So we're talking about an sp2 hybrid, and it's trigonal planar, which means a triangular shape and flat, so tri trigonal planar, and the bond angles are 120 degrees. If you don't understand that, just memorize it. Um, the, the last part is if carbon is in the center, is carbon only bonded to two other uh, groups? Uh, what is the bond angle and uh, what is the hybridized bond? That's correct. So it's an SP um, hybrid. Uh, it's a linear um, um, 
uh, molecule or bond. And so that's when we see, uh, sometimes we see uh, it could be a triple bond, for example, with, with carbon. Okay, but now we're talking about a chiral carbon uh, bonded to four different groups, uh, tetrahedron and sp3 hybridized. So these are the kinds of things that should be coming to your mind as soon as you see this. So now we're going to convert this three-dimensional shape into a two-dimensional shape. In order to do this, um, I want you to understand uh, the, the rule about a Fisher projection. The rule about a Fisher projection is that the horizontal line, so this is the horizontal line here, always represents um, uh, substituents or groups that are coming towards you. So this is a substituent or group coming towards you, and so is this, coming towards you. Now, I have to look at this molecule and place my body somewhere where I can see the substituents coming towards me, okay? And it, um, I'm just going to do, uh, I'm going to show you the easiest way. So I want to place my body so that groups are coming towards me. The easiest way for me to uh, place my body would be right here, down here. Now try to imagine that if you were sitting right here, this a uh, dark triangle means that Y is coming out of your screen right now. So Y is sticking out of your screen. The straight line means that this WC bond is along the plane of your screen and CX is along the plane of your screen. So that means it's right there on the computer. But this one Y is coming outside, is coming towards you. And then a broken line indicates that it's going away from you. So this is away from you, but to the right of carbon. This is towards you, but to the right of carbon. So if I am sitting right here, can you see that for me, from my point of view, Y is to my left and Z is to my right. W is above me and X is below me. Okay, and that's because Y is coming towards you and Z is going away from you. So from this angle, Y is to my left, Z is to my right. Okay, so that's what I'm going to write. I'm going to put Y here. I'm going to put Z on the other side to my right, converting to two-dimensional shape, and I put W at the top, and then I put X at the bottom. Please convert the uh, structures 2, 3, and 4 into Fisher projections. So you just take some pen and paper, just do your best, convert to those two uh, Fisher projections. And then we'll talk about the rules. It's usually you'll have the oxygen come out on the right side. You'll see a line coming around the right side with an oxygen on it. Um, sometimes Acer does have questions about that. They'll have a Fisher projection uh, with a sugar and um, a three-dimensional, uh, um, I'm sorry, a, uh, uh, a ring. But it's very, very easy question because you always just look for where the oxygen is. Because the oxygen is inside the ring, then you count how many groups from the oxygen. It's always a very straightforward question. Uh, Gamsat, uh, questions on uh, Newman projections? Um, first of all, you don't always count clockwise or counterclockwise from the oxygen ring. You just uh, count the number of carbons from the oxygen ring. Then you look at the substituents, because you'll always have a different substituent, like CH2OH or something like that. Yes, this seminar is being recorded, so you'll be able to look at it la uh, later. Okay, um, so these are your uh, Fisher projections. I'm hoping that you have the same thing um, that you, you have in front of you. And now I'm going to give you the two rules uh, for your Fisher projections. So that structure is one, two, three, and four. Here are the two rules. The first rule you are not going to use, but I feel obligated to tell you what the rule is, even though you're not going to use it, uh, just in case they do something uh, terrible. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the first rule is that you're allowed to um, compare these by uh, turning them by 180 degrees. Now notice I said 180 degrees, not 90 degrees. Because uh, in, in the structure one, uh, you see that Y and Z are coming towards you. So because Y and Z are coming towards you, I think you could imagine that you can't just turn this 90 degrees. You would have to turn it a full 180 degrees uh, in order um, for you to still have Y and Z coming towards you. So that's one rule that you can do to compare uh, different molecules is you can uh, turn it on its side 180 degrees, but we're not going to do that. Okay, we're going to apply the second rule. The second rule is that you observe two molecules um, that have atoms in the same location. So you try to find two structures that have atoms in the same location and then you fix that atom. By fix, I mean you won't move that atom. Then you're allowed to rotate the other three atoms clockwise or counterclockwise as much as you want. So I'm going to do it once and then you do it for the, uh, for the others to see which ones fit. So I'm going to compare structure one and then structure two. So I look at structure one and structure two and I notice there's only one letter that is in common and that is the placement of the letter Z. Both have Z in the exact location. So because of that, I'm going to now rotate the other three to see if I can get the two molecules to match. So keeping Z in its same position, not moving, I can see that if I rotate W this way, then Y this way and X this way, structure one and structure two matches exactly. I know these two structures are superimposable. So I fix Z and then I rotate. I could have rotated it this way, but I checked. And I saw that if I rotated it, the W down here, it doesn't map. So I tried rotating the W the opposite way, and then Y here, and then X here, and it works out. So now, please, see if you can find two other molecules that match. Yep, you got it. Yeah, when you look at structure number one, and you compare it with number four, um, you can fix the letter Y. And then once you fix the letter, letter Y, if you bring W down here, matches X to the right, matches Z up here, matches. So one and four match. And that means they're superimposable. And that means structure three is the one that uh, does not work with any of the others. And so that one is not superimposable. So then structure uh, three would be the answer, uh, 40C. And uh, now we'll move on to question 41, unless someone has a question about this specifically. OK, so um, question 41 uh, it talks about two organic compounds. And um, so we'll just. Um, quickly uh, write this out. It's not going to be pretty, but uh, um, I think you'll get the uh, gist of it. Okay, so the compounds start with butte. There's no type of compound that you will see more often on the GAMSAT than a, than a compound that starts with butte. Because compounds with four carbons can do a lot of different types of reactions. So you'll see butanoic acids, you'll see butanes, you'll see uh, um, butanals uh, and so on and so forth. So um, the first one is uh, uh, two butanol. So bute means four carbons. All means it's an alcohol, and um, it's identified on the second position. So uh, two butanol. So uh, this is, of course, uh, what we would call a secondary alcohol because uh, at the central carbon the carbon in the center, you can see that there are two R groups, two alkyl groups attached to it, so it's a secondary alcohol. If there was three, it would be tertiary, and if it was one carbon attached to it, it would be a primary carbon. Next we have 2,2-dichlorobutane, 
So uh, it tell, telling us the chlorine groups are on the second carbon. So we have two, and it's on the second carbon twice. So we have two, two uh, dichlorobutane. <clears throat> That's sort of a chlorine. And, um, and the question is saying, uh, stereoisomers are possible for? Well, what we look for uh, for stereoisomers is um, um, we're looking for the number of chiral carbons or stereocenters, and that's the number of carbons that are bonded to four different substituents. So we want to identify that. And they could have even asked us how many uh, stereoisomers are possible, or more specifically, they could have asked us how many enantiomers are possible uh, for these uh, compounds. And we would be able to calculate that by an equation called, uh, that goes 2 to the power of n, where n is equal to the number of chiral carbons or stereocenters. Yes, that's correct. So um, to identify whether or not there's four different substituents, I look at the central carbon and I notice that it's attached to OH group. That's one substituent. Hydrogen, one substituent. Um, a methyl group, meth, one carbon. That's one sub substituent, an ethyl group, two carbons. That's another substituent. Common mistake that students make, of course, is that they, they look just at the neighboring atom to determine chirality. That is incorrect. Uh, the expression for chirality is that it's a carbon that is bonded to four different substituents. It is not a carbon that is bonded just to four different atoms. It's four different substituents. And so you look at the entire group, and this group is different from this group, which is different from this group, which is different from this one. So we have one chiral carbon. We completely ignore the other carbons because they all have multiple bonds to hydrogens. This one's bonded to three hydrogens. This one's two to three. So therefore, it's impossible that they can be chiral carbons because there can't be bonded to four different things. And yes, thus there is only one a chiral carbon there. And here, the central carbon is clearly not chiral because it's bonded to chlorine twice. So this is an achiral carbon in an achiral compound, and this one is a chiral carbon in a chiral compound. <clears throat> so um, we won't uh, get into it, but it is possible. <laughs> I'm just going to drop this one in the back of your mind, but it is possible for you to have a chiral carbon but the compound is achiral. That is possible, and that type of compound is called what? Yes, it's called meso, and meso means there is a mirror of symmetry. And I'm just going to quickly show you what, uh, what um, that would look like. So I'm going to quickly show you here. Um, can somebody please name this compound? Uh, it, this is going to be an alcohol because there are OH groups, and it's going to be a diol because there's two OH groups. And yes, uh, it would be 2,4-pentane-diol, um, uh, or uh, pentane-2,4-diol. Yeah. So, um, and this would be called something called a meso compound because indeed there would be two chiral carbons, two groups that are attached to four different substituents, two chiral carbons, but meso, uh, you can remember that the word meso stands for, um, oh boy, this is going to get worse, okay, uh, meso stands for, I don't know why I thought I could write this, um, but anyway, meso stands for mirror of symmetry. So mirror of symmetry. So if you can draw um, um, a line um, to show that the molecule is symmetric, and here is the mirror of symmetry, and yes, you can draw the line right down a carbon. So you can draw it at any point in the molecule, and if you can get a mirror of symmetry within the molecule, then uh, this is a meso compound. So there are two chiral carbons, but the molecule is achiral not chiral, because there is a plane of symmetry. But that was not the question they asked. I'm just preparing you for some other questions that sometimes they do ask. <clears throat>